And welcome back to Pastor Plex Podcast. I'm your host, Pastor Plex, and joining me in studio is none other than Mrs. Leah Brown, a longtime contributor to the show. Welcome, Leah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, we're talking Happy about New Year. Some, yeah, Happy New Year. Yeah. This is pretty great. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, Leah and I have been talking about just kind of the past year, 2023, and sort of the some of the tragedy that, that was experienced along with some triumph. But one in particular struggle that we point out was just the sudden passing of your brother. And we're going to just talk, get into that a little bit and of why, how that impacted you and how that impacted people who did lose someone in 2023. But specifically for your case, how that we can learn a lot from what God's doing in and through your story. Yeah. We had our first holiday season without my brother this year. So that was kind of, I know a lot of people can relate to what it's like to walk through the holidays after loss and it's not fun. It's what, kind of how hard. does that, is that, is like a, a feeling of, doom of dread of oh no not for me none of that just just sadness yeah yeah but um so i'll start with giving a little bit of a family history backstory here and if you think while i'm talking oh goodness why is she airing all this dirty laundry i can assure you rest at ease it's already been aired so <laughs> you don't need to worry about any of that okay. um but also and i don't see it as dirty laundry i kind of see it as as a testimony, I feel like the passing of my brother, we were able to witness God's power in a really magnificent way. And when you witness something like that, you just can't keep it to yourself. You mm. have to talk about it yeah. because I don't know that I have like a lesson or a nice pretty bow to tie on the story, but I feel like it's a testimony worth sharing um, because God showed me a lot of himself um, through the tragedy. And so yeah, so let's, let's talk about talk this about is your it. older brother. Right. So I'm one of six kids. Um, I'm, num I'm number two. Number, number two. one is Andrew, and he's the brother who passed away. And then I have four younger siblings, three brothers and a sister. Um, and so, yeah, we our age range is like 10 years. And then I have my mom and my dad. Um, and my mom and my dad raised us in the faith. They, they, they love the Lord. But before my mom came to know the Lord, um, she she had a really tragic upbringing. She was adopted. Her parents, um, rest in peace. <laughs> not really. <laughs> what do you uh, mean by that? They're not rest. They're not resting in peace. So Only God knows. But right, right. So most likely not in heaven. I mean, as my mom's mom was on her deathbed, taking her last breaths, my mom was there with her, and she said. They're coming for me, Kelly. Don't let them take me. Don't let them take me. I mean, and this is after an entire lifetime of my mom sharing the gospel with her and her rejecting it. So, you know, uh, this does make me think of when, you know, when we did the afterlife. Yeah. yeah. See, uh, like, and when uh, that one dude still told the story of like the demons grabbing him and just yeah. like, th wow. Yeah. That's freaky. Okay. Yeah, so those... she had an experience like that as, as she's dying. Right, mm -hmm. and and was able to vocalize it, and so we, you know, we don't have any reason to believe they're resting in peace. But you never know; God can do anything, and that's, that's what wild. this this tale that's is about. That's why we tell people about Jesus right there. I don't want anyone to have that experience of they're coming for me, help me. But it it's hard. I mean, my mom told them about Jesus every second she could. Yeah. From the moment that my mom was saved. Um, How when, old was she when she was saved? I don't know the exact age, but it was young twenties, maybe okay. uh, yeah, late yeah. teens. Yeah. It was uh, it was through meeting my father mm. um, and my father's family, and they brought her to youth group, brought her to church, shared the gospel with her. She had a radical encounter with Jesus, and that radical encounter with Jesus was then um, followed by a radical encounter with some demons. <laughs> yes, so th she had been saved. Yep, um, she. My younger brother, my older brother Andrew, had been born. He was a little over one. Hold on, and just when we're talking about demons, not, I mean, I think of you as a pretty reformed person who doesn't dabble in charismania. I come to, from a very reformed right, background. So, like, this is sort of wild to hear from you. I think you. this is a good caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm okay. glad you bring that up because this is not like, this isn't Leah Brown. Ah, oh, she's, you know, she goes to, you know, First Assembly of God down the street. So, this is like a normal thing that happens every week. No, this is Leah God, who comes from a very reformed... Oh, Leah God, wow. <laughs> Leah Brown. <laughs> Freudian slip. So very, oh, God. A, a complex we're working through. Go ahead. Very reformed family, yeah. um, which is kind of funny, and I think that that speaks to a little bit of, uh, of a tension and a struggle that I'm going to get into later. Yeah. Um, we, don't, we don't talk about these things, despite the fact that my mother 
after a one year after birthing my older brother Andrew, while I was in her womb, she was brought to an exorcist after having a, a lot of struggle. She had been saved a couple years prior, but there were all of these things, these torments, these voices, these compulsions. It's like this in a. I mean, I won't get into too many details. No, but I just think this for is the where the details times, matter. This is it's helpful. I mean, hurting herself. Okay. Um, just no no control over herself. Um, this so the question that comes up for me on, on this what is do you think she was saved at that point or maybe I don't know or who knows I do okay so she was saved but still experiencing like a demonic oppression of some sort that had probably been there her entire life she had been exposed to demonic power forces her entire childhood I mean she before meeting my dad was a practicing witch so she did okay hold on before your mom married your dad, she was a practicing witch, mm -hmm. like in a coven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sorry, I mean, what else is it? I think you would find that most practicing witches aren't actually in covens, but the scary thing. Well, what do you do? Like, what do you call your community of witches? It's not, a, I, 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 that is what you call a community of witches, yes. But I think something that I've come to terms with through learning a lot of this family history and hearing these stories told and then witnessing my brother's tragic yeah. passing and everything that led up to that is that their spiritual forces are super real and you can access spiritual power through darkness and through light. Right. And, and although the counter, like the dark spiritual power is counterfeit, but it's still, it's like those, those, um, the dark arts guys in Exodus, right? Mm -hmm. When Moses throws down Janice his staff. Janice and Jambres or whatever. <laughs> oh, they have names. Yeah. Are they named in Exodus? They're, no, they're named in a uh, tradition. Uh, Church history. Timothy. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's like they they were able to throw down their staffs and make snakes too. Like there was something really crazy happening through dark spiritual power. Now, and I don't want to be overly nuanced, but was there a difference between black magic and white magic? I mean, I would say it's all dark, but like, did, did, was she like, oh, but we just did the white magic, you know? I think that, I don't, I don't know the answer okay, to that. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's fine. But, but I think that bla dark magic is being disguised as good magic. Kay. You have shows like The Good Witch. Right. We, we like to dramatize it and make it like, uh -huh. it, there's even little kids shows. There's a little kids show that I love, um, and I won't. It's called Bluey, and there's one episode called Magic, and I don't even want, like, I kind of got icky letting my yeah. kids watch it because right. they were like, the one rule of magic is you only use magic for good, and that can that's just convincing you that, you know, magic can be used for good. Right. And and I think that that's a lie from the pit of hell because when you start tapping into those powers, it's you, you get to be God is what magic is. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can control the forces to to do what I want them to do. Yeah. So there is a very real spiritual realm, as obviously you know, and the Bible is very clear about it. It's all over the Old and New Testament. It, but for me, growing up, we didn't we didn't really talk about that stuff. Yeah. But I'll bring you back to my mom. I'm in her womb. My brother's one year old, and for whatever reason, she is taken to see an exorcist. My dad goes with her. Um, and it, I mean that was not an easy decision. Like, for them. I, and I know this, but where do you find? Do they look at the yellow pages, Exorcist? I mean, like, how do they? Do <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but just like, how do you find these people? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Through maybe a pastor. Okay, fair but clearly not this one. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I actually I would know where to go. Anyway, go you ahead. You would? Yeah, I would. Uh, <laughs> anyway, as the story goes. So if you have an issue, just come to me. I'll I'll put you right. Go ahead. Um, there were she. She was exercised many demons on that night, um, and that like, involved thrashing, animal sounds. She tried to like kill my dad, who was in the room, and so. But as my dad tells the story, like he faced those demons, like they spoke to him through her, and he remembers the thing that um, he talks about is they told him lies and accusations they knew all of his dark secrets of his entire life up to that point which he was young he was like 21 or 22 uh, maybe even like 20 um and and they knew all of these secrets of his that he had never shared and they were speaking them at him making accusations trying to terrify him you have no place in this room who do you think you are you have no authority over us and blah blah blah, blah. and 
And did so, he like plead the blood of Jesus? What, what did he do? Yeah, the, lots of pleading the blood of Jesus, lots of scripture, lots of like laying on of hands. Like uh, the exorcist knew what to do, but that I mean, that's kind of in the weeds. I mean, I guess. No, I mean that's the stuff that we're like. I mean, <laughs> that's what you're here for. That's Leah. what that's what the show is about. Hold on, but Leah, like, when did your dad tell you all this? You know, so this was kind of that's an interesting question. I don't know if you know the answer to that question, or no, you don't. I had never been told this story outright by my mom or my dad now some of my siblings apparently had been told the story but I had never asked but I had always sort of known which is a really weird like I had always known this pseudo fantastical tale of my mom and some demons it, but I, I didn't know any details and I didn't know a narrative I just kind of had a feeling did you want to know or like I didn't want to know because I also didn't believe it okay <laughs> <laughs> so oh, fair enough. and that kind of goes into like my young childhood my mom was was very mentally ill even even after that um, she continued to be mentally ill, and she continued to get worse as I was a child. What were the symptoms of that? Just well, we'll call it a schizophrenic cocktail. Okay. So it's a little schizophrenia mixed in with some other mental illness. Okay, fair enough. And that, that's a big part of my story and, and a difficult upbringing from my perspective just because, you know, all the mommy wound things. Like, mm -hmm. you want you want these things out of your mom that she's she, – you think everyone else has this, but you don't. And um, that's something that I worked through and healed through. And, well, I mean, you're never done, but whatever. So something that I came to terms with, I, this is an, a side note, but I, I really struggled in college, my college years when I was really growing closer to God. I struggled with this anger because I had prayed my whole life for God to heal my mom and he wouldn't do mm -hmm. it. And I was so frustrated by that. Um, side note again, I watch, I was watching the chosen last night and I got to this part, which, which I mean, season in which season show? three oh, yeah. where he's talking to little James. Yes. And he's, oh, it's, so uh, good. it's I think it's season three, episode two, maybe. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And little James has got like a limp, he's yeah. limp and, and he's like, how am I supposed to go out and heal people with the power and authority you've given me if, if, and I'm not healed. And Jesus is like, do you want me to heal you? I could heal you right now. He's like, but I also could not heal you. And think about the testimony and the story that you have. Um, if you, you still believe in me while you're still suffering. And I was like, oh, I was a fountain listening to that because it, it, that was a lot of the realizations that I had kind of come to and healing with yeah. those, like I said, mommy wounds. I'm a big up. fan of The Chosen. Yeah, I, I am too. I don't know that. I, I don't think that part was taken out of scripture, but it's a really nice no, character awesome. arc. Yeah, it was for great. one of the disciples. So anyway, um, yes, my mom was mentally ill growing up. And I think that because of that, my brother, I wasn't the only one who had a lot of wounds from that. Uh, um, my brother had probably 10x my, my wounds from that, even being older and witnessing and experiencing more. Um, How much older? About two years. Okay. Yeah, just two years. Um, and so while I, like I mentioned, had a lot of anger at God, I also had a, a, a faith, which was not of my own. It was, it was a gift from him, a faith that was unwavering even in my struggles and my anger and my turmoil. And that faith that blossomed into like a really flourishing relationship with him and a call in my life to follow and pursue him, much thanks to, you know, God working through you in college. But my brother didn't have that. He yeah. struggled. I mean, and he was always a little bit turmoiled. He was kind of like... Did he go to college? He did. He went to St. John's University. It's a really um, prestigious school. Like in, Ivy League. Like it's in the not quite Ivy League, but it is in the East. It's, yeah. it's close to all the Ivy Leagues. Yeah, it's like right by there. Yeah, Brown and all those mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, my brother, he's incredibly intellectual. He's Everybody who meets him thinks he's the smartest person they've ever met. He's also really philosophical. Um, and and while he also was raised in the same Bible-believing family that I was, I don't know that he ever latched onto it mm -hmm. the same way. He always had questions, and he always searched, and he would find answers to those questions. But he would keep searching, and it was really never enough for him. Um, that said, he would still say that he was a professing Bible believing Christian. And that's part of the conversation that I had with him before he died, which we'll get to. But um, so yeah, he goes off to college. Um, like I said, a lot of turmoil from childhood, unworked through, um, and he was pretty focused on it. He marries my high school 
one of my high school best friends. Aww. Yes. And they're, they'd been dating all through high school. They were sweethearts. They get married. They moved to Phoenix together. They're teaching at this school, um, a little prep school for kids. And, and they're happily married for a while. And then all of a sudden, they're not happily married. And then all of a sudden, we find out that they're getting a divorce. And that was kind of like a secret. They didn't show up to Christmas one year. And, and it was like, oh, what's going on? So they get a divorce. And nobody really knows what happened, except for I'm talking to her because I remained close with her. But what we did know was that when they moved to Phoenix, they both really started walking away from their faith at some point. Right. We didn't know details. But they both started walking away from their faith. They both started seeing Eastern therapists. So like Union, Eastern healing, shamans, like all the things. They started getting it in Arizona is actually a pretty big hot spot for oh, that yeah. new age stuff. Crystals, rocks, all the good All the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh. Uh, yoga. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Uh. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it is. I mean, like the mountains in of itself is the place you go to meditate in the Mosque. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, won't get into that too much, but. But yeah, so we know that they've divorced. They've be- both been into this. But they didn't really thing. tell you that. It wasn't like, "Hey, family, I'm I'm leaving my wife, or it's not working out." You just found out. I mean, how did you find out? Yeah, I don't remember exactly how we found out. But, but did it they was, actually ever it was get divorced? Definitely after the yes, they did. Okay. It was after the fact, and it was after like he clearly had pulled away from family. Like he, I think he felt a lot of shame, and he just wasn't connecting with us. He wasn't coming. To shame for not anyway. being a Christian. Shame for divorce. All of it. Mm-hmm. All of it. Um, and we didn't know the circumstances of the divorce. And so there were a lot of assumptions made. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, like I said, I made a point to talk to Megan because we were very close uh, you know, for so many years. I mean, very close. And so I kept up with her. And then I did learn the circumstances. I mean, it wasn't her fault like we all thought. It was him. He had kind of drifted away. I mean, it takes two to tango, but it always does. But he had kind of drifted away in his love for her and latched onto like another girl at school and he didn't want to cheat on her, so he got a divorce, told her he'd never really loved her and and that she was just a surrogate for um you know, healing oh, wow. some childhood trauma. But I, mean, I maybe that's too much. That might be too much dirty laundry, but oh, well, whatever. Um But that's hard. I mean, I, and I think that's hard. Any marriage that you sort of feel like you were used for something is just unbelievably painful. But probably everybody goes into every marriage with trying to get some sort of fulfillment, fill whatever's lacking, and that's only been meant to be filled up by God. But yeah, yeah, that's really good. That's a really good point. But that's that's around the time when he started. Then that's around like eight eight ish years ago. He starts really drifting away and losing touch with the family and feeling isolated. And like I said, the shame I think of all of those things was the driving factor there. And we were all just kind of really sad, like really sad that Andrew, the funny, witty, wins every single board game every single time, isn't showing up to family holidays. He's not call- he's not joining the family online games. Like all the things, he's just kind of isolating himself, and and that was sad. And then so at some point. Um, Um, at some point I made a a point and actually it might've been more him. He was reaching out to me and we started having these like weekly phone calls and this is in the last couple years. How long were the phone calls? Hour, two hours. I mean, as long as I could, my husband would take the kids to gymnastics on Thursdays and I would just make dinner Mm -hmm. and chat on the phone with him for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And every time, and I was so grateful for that. And actually, that started when COVID hit. That's when COVID hit and everything kind of shut down. My family, we started getting together online, me and the siblings, and and Andrew started joining, and we started playing Jackbox games. Oh, fun! The phone calls kind of spawned out of that, and and it was really good, and I was just really excited. But I'll say, every time I talked to him on the phone, the at the beginning of the conversation, he would sound really just distraught, Mm. and then by the end of the conversation, he's laughing and he's back to his very his normal Andrew self, and it's good, and that's part of why I kept it up because I knew, like I said, there was a lot of emotional inner turmoil. He spoke therapy constantly, and he was always telling me about his therapy, which I have also been to therapy, so I was able to kind of, like, meet him there a little bit and talk about some of the things. I think I felt like he and I had a connection that was deeper because we had a lot of the same memories and the same experiences as children. Like, a lot of my mom's deeper, like, struggles happened when maybe he and I were the only ones conscious enough to have those memories. Mm. Not that it didn't affect everyone, but it really struck us. And so we were able to kind of talk through that. And I was, I always would make a point, like, trying to show him the gospel through 
our past and, and his past. It was, like it how was, Jesus was actually there in the midst of all that as opposed to like completely vacuous. Yes, and how Jesus is the solution and the healing agent right. for all of that. We're not not young, <laughs> right. not personality tests, right. not all of the things, which of course, you know, whatever, we could get into that. But I, I tried to, I would meet him on, on, on equal footing with things like the Enneagram, which is kind of rooted from young. And like, we would talk that and then we, I would try to bring him like deeper and, and share the gospel anyway. So it was intentional, but it was also awesome. Mm. Um, okay. That's a, that's the background. Kay. And so we're having one of these phone calls in June last year. Just a normal Thursday phone call. No big deal. And then he, on that phone call, he tells me um, that he has some bad news for me. And I was like, what? Okay. And he says, well, my wife. So he had gotten remarried to um, the girl that he worked with, whom I knew and I had met in the past um, a couple times. My meetings with her were always very interesting. (laughs) I bet. (laughs) Um, He said, she's asked me to leave. She, she was kicking him out. And I was like, oh, man, Andrew, yikes. And he was really upset about it. Um, and I, it, on the tip of my tongue, it was on the tip of my tongue, I was this close to telling him, well, just come stay at my house. Like, I've got a big house. I've got extra room. I've got plenty of food. I, I, I could give you anything you want. Just come to my house. But I didn't. I didn't say that. Um, and I didn't feel like it was fear holding me back by no means. Like I wanted to make that offer, but there was something in me telling me just don't yet, don't do it. And so I, I kind of held on to that and I listened and I asked questions and I told him I was praying for him and that I loved him and that anything he needed, I was here for him, you know, <laughs> but that was an intentional remark, not just to show off. Like a lot of people will say, um, <laughs> not everybody is like that, but a lot are anything you need. Yeah. Anything you need, just don't call me. Yes, All right, go exactly. Ahead. Um, so we have this. Uh, we have this conversation in June, and as soon as I'm off the phone with him, I call my dad, and I'm yeah. like, "Dad, what's going on with Andrew?" <laughs> oh wow! And he was like, "Oh yeah, he told you about that. I know he's been wanting to share with you." And um, that must be really hard for your dad to kind of keep that to himself. No, my dad is a very stoic man. Easy to keep it to himself. <laughs> My mother, on the other hand, <laughs> now she deserves a lot of credit for not sharing that. I got it. <laughs> now I'm not sure how long they had known. I think I was one. I think I had been one of the last people to know. But um, so it goes. The people you love the most, it's the hardest to tell them the hard mm-hmm. things. Yeah. That's at least that's what I tell myself. That's good. I like that. When I'm out of the loop. <laughs> they just love me too much to tell. Yeah, me. it's just too hard because they love me so much. Okay, so. So my dad says, okay, yes, yes, we know. And I'm like, dad, well, what are we going to do? We got to do something. We got to help him. Yeah. And my dad says, don't you dare offer for him to come to your house. Oh, interesting. And I was like, what? And he's like, he is not going near my grandchildren. And I was like, what? Yeah. (laughs) And then he says, I'm not letting him bring his demons in there. And I once again, what? No, to that I said, Oh, so you don't want his demons <laughs> around my children, but you'll let them be around your children because, mind you, you still have two little ones living in the house. And by little ones, I mean 24 and 26. <laughs> no judgment. Uh, Go on. <laughs> those boys, man. Sometimes you got four boys. You got to make sure you get them out of the house. Yeah, absolutely. Time. Much love to them. Much love. But The best thing for you. Mm-hmm. Live on your own. <laughs> Well, not always, because, you know, Andrew did fly the coop, and we see what happened to him. But, so, my dad says he's not bringing those demons near my grandchildren, and I'm like, you're absolutely ridiculous. Like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. We are, I am not going to let my brother be without a home, which he was not financially, he didn't really have a means of taking care of himself, and he's never been good at taking care of himself, and I think that's part of why his new wife wanted him to leave, because he was not contributing i don't know i am not going to speculate but i know what we do know is that andrew is super easy to love and everybody loves andrew but he's very difficult to care for Mm. that's kind of been uh, one of the themes of his life anyway so back to the conversation with my dad and i said 
dad, you're ridiculous. There's no way. Like, the best way to reach people is to show up for them in their time of need. I'm going to take him in. I'm going to be superwoman, whatever. These demons, that's nonsense. I'm sick and tired of this nonsense. I don't, like, remind you, I have not heard this this tale right. at this point. And I'm just kind of like, it's all hoopla. It's like some stupid family hoopla fantasy that we don't actually, which oh, I feel bad for saying that. But that's kind of how I felt at the time. <laughs> so that's just a confession uh, that we don't really talk about. But apparently it happened. But we're also all stoics and we don't believe in that stuff. So it's just like a really weird place to be. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and so my dad was like, Leah, I'm telling you, do not bring him in. And I was like, well, tell me about this demon stuff anyway. And that's when my mom and dad both got on the phone and they finally shared like this whole tale that I had never heard. Does your mom, mom remember it or is she like No, she remembers it. Yeah. Huh. She has lots of details. Huh. Yeah, maybe you should be interviewing her and yeah. not me. <laughs> Come on, Kelly, get on here. No, she, <laughs> there'd be too many tears. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. uh, uh, <laughs> Anyway, and so they tell me this tale, and I still am super skeptical. I still think it's a little bit ridiculous. I'm like, that was 30 years ago. Like, come on. Like, whatever. And I said, Dad, I'm going to invite him to my house. I, I, I hear you on that, but he's my brother. And if he's going to, like, kind of get – now, mind you – like I said, he'd walked away from his faith. He was struggling in so many ways. And all of us in the family had been praying for him to come back to the Lord. Like that, I mean, that was at the tip of the forefront of our minds constantly. And my prayer had actually kind of shifted to, and I think everyone else would testify that the same thing. Our prayer had kind of shifted to bring him to rock bottom so that he will come back to Christ. Mm. Um, that was definitely, that was definitely what we'd been praying and so my dad says, I, I told my dad, like, this is rock bottom. We're going to help him. And my dad was like, he can come to my house. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and, I, and I was like, okay. He said, Leah, if, if my house weren't an option, I wouldn't fight you on this. But my house is an option, and I'm equipped to handle, to fight this battle. He's like, I don't want you to fight this battle with your kids in the house. Wow. And I was like, still thought it was ridiculous. Okay, so... Anyway, I talked to Andrew again a week later. I don't make the offer. At this point, he tells me he doesn't feel so good. He's moving. He's packing up his stuff. He's trying to look for a place. He's got a couple options, um, which my dad is trying to convince him to move to my dad's house. But he says he doesn't feel so good. And I'm like, yeah, I know, Andrew. That's kind of par for the course with you. And he's like, yeah, I know. And I was like, have you gone to a doctor? No, I, I don't really feel like it. And I was like, Andrew, will you just go, please? Just go to a doctor get checked out and he was like well I might actually do that my eyes look a little yellow and I was like Andrew go to the ER wow because <laughs> I had had a friend do something go to through something where that was like the first symptom and I was just kind of thinking all of that and and he listened he went to the ER well, way to go um and then it was like a day later I get a phone call from him giving me an update he he tells me that his liver's in really bad condition um uh, but he's septic He's got a septic infection, and they've given him this regimen that two out of three people do really well on, and he's probably it's probably not a big deal, and if all else fails, like a transplant is an option. So I was like, oh. and I'm still kind of like, yeah, okay, you're sick. God, God is allowing this. Like you're sick. He's gonna heal you. He's gonna. Which I'm not saying that to him. I'm thinking this. I'm right. Like, this is rock bottom. This is great. We, this and, is what we've been praying for. Yeah, and my mom calls me, and she's just in tears. I met a friend's um game night um celebrating a birthday <laughs> oh i remember that you were there. i was there and then you like left <laughs> and i walked out of the game you were, this is where you are so you um, i think my brother's dying and we're like you need to go and you're like okay let's keep playing and i'm like well but that speaks to i'm glad you can testify to that chris because that speaks to the skepticism that i still had in my mind yeah yeah because you came back in he's just ah, my brother said he's dying and i'm like shouldn't you like i don't know not be here or something. I don't know. It was it was a strange moment. I didn't I didn't fully I didn't believe it. Okay. I, and yeah. Nobody and that's had fair, said that was the first phone call you got, and it's kind of weird. I think you're probably still processing. And it. I thought it was drama, honestly. I th and your brother was prone to some drama. And so you. yes, and other people too. Okay. So I I kind of thought we were being dramatic. Here, okay. You know, but it, but n nonetheless, on the phone. With my parents, I gave them this pep talk, this excellent speech. Too bad it's not recorded. 
And I was just like, you guys, this is what we've been praying for. We've been begging God to bring him to rock bottom, to bring him back to himself. And that's what this is. So our job is to step into this and to be agents for the gospel and to love him well. And what is that? And I was very inspirational and I believed all of it. I mean, it. I'm inspired now. This is great. But I, I didn't believe more often. I didn't believe he was actually going to die. Right. I didn't think that. Yeah, yeah. I thought. Like I said, maybe miraculous healing. That'd be cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I also, like I said, skepticism is the theme here. I didn't really believe he was going to die, and I definitely didn't believe this demon nonsense. I thought it was all kind of ridiculous. And then it's a couple days later. It's just like, oh, like he's getting worse. He's not recovering. And then finally, on the Fourth of July, that was kind of the the day where. I got the phone call. I actually, I think I made a phone call and they used the word hospice. And that was when it hit me. Like that was the moment I was like, what? Hospice? Like, no, 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 no. Like I didn't believe it. Mm. Um, but I did. I was like, he's dying. He's going to die. Mm. Um, and wow, this is a lot of background. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so you, so you fly out there. Yeah. So, I, I felt like, you know, and we were at that 4th of July party and you and Adrian were both really great. You were like, you should go out there. You should go out there. And I, I was kind of like, oh, that's a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But then the more I thought about it, I was like, I should go out there. And then there was a moment in my mind, um, that was really definitive. It was just this, this moment where God was saying, I'm going to do something really cool. And you get to come be a part of it. Now, don't fly out here like you think you're going to change anything. Mm. Like, that's not you. But I'm going to do something really cool. And if you want to be a part of it, I have a plan. And I was like, okay. Mm. So I bought a ticket at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> this is the next day. I wait for... Kyle to get home from work. He gets home at four. He brings me to the airport. My flight's at seven. Um, and if that flight hadn't been delayed 30 minutes, I would not have gotten on that plane because of the time. It was super busy anyway. So thank God for that. Like literally, thank God for that. Flight delayed. I get out to Phoenix. Um, even then, I just had no idea what I was walking into. You know, like I had planned, I had tried to convince Adrian to, well, she wanted to come with, but the flights were very expensive. Um, like just kind of like, okay, we'll go get a hotel and we'll relax and hang out and I'll see my brother. And still just didn't, didn't know how dire the situation was. Just that's, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, like there's just this skepticism yeah. Yeah, yeah. every step of the way. Um, 